Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to our session titled Sports Careers, Religious Conviction, and Uncertain Futures. I mean, religion isn't something that automatically comes to mind when we talk about sports, but it is this interesting connection that our panel will demonstrate. So without much elaboration, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Mark Han from the University of Amsterdam. And the title of his talk is Between Mysticism and Modernity, Contradictory Expectations and Mystical Warfare in Two Senegalese Sports. Mark Han. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Adnan. Um, yeah, and it's really nice to be here in such an intimate space with you guys. Um, soccer and wrestling are both hugely, hugely popular spectator sports in Senegal, uh, as well as representing increasingly important career paths for young men in an economic climate which is characterized by neoliberal policy, uh, high unemployment, and remittances. Within this particular configuration, sport emerges not only as a lucrative uh, um, opportunity, but also as a significant site for the expression of belonging and the cultivation of identities in the Senegalese post-colony. It enables young men in particular to position themselves in relation to the local and the global, and indeed provides a set of symbolic and moral codes within which to do both at the same time. Whereas the globalized sport of soccer is inextricably linked with economic projects of migration to the global north, wrestling presents itself as a resolutely local and community-based activity, steeped heavily in magico religious beliefs and rituals. They effectively offer two alternative models of masculine success. On the one hand, the absent, uh, the absent provider playing soccer in Europe, and on the other hand, the wrestling champion, an icon of traditional values. During a fieldwork period of one year in the Senegalese capital of Dakar, I spent time with aspiring soccer players and wrestlers, accompanying them during their training, preparation, competition, and daily lives. Uh, today, I will discuss the contrasting magico religious discourses and practices which I observed in the two sports, using the local metaphor of guerre mystique, or mystical warfare, to explore athlete subjective positions towards notions of tradition, modernity, and belief. Uh, I'd like to start with a um, with, uh, with with uh, an excerpt from my field notes. Um, next slide. How does this work? Okay. <laughs> um, so from my field notes, we went into a house where there was a waiting room in front of three doors, reminiscent of a doctor's surgery. One door was an office. The second looked like a living room when I glimpsed inside and the third was the chamber in which the marabou received his clients. There was a sign in Wolof above the door saying, you have to be well-dressed to enter. Another sign instructed visitors to take their shoes off. Modu, my wrestler friend, sat next to Serin Babakar, the marabou, and explained that he had a combat on the 21st of the month. Serin Babakar studied his Quran, his calendar, and talismanic scriptures, and asked a few questions about the name of the opponent, he had a very soft voice. He told Modu to buy a mortar, as well as some green cloth and some white cloth. He also instructed him to buy a black goat, 21 oranges, and 21 lemons, because the combat was on the 21st of the month, and to put them in water. Modu later had to bathe in the remaining liquid and give the fruit to the Talibé, or the street children, of his local area. Um, as the account of Marabutic consultation suggests, wrestling is saturated in mystical practices in Wolof Kharfakhufa, which combine animist traditions with magical interpretations of Quranic scripture. Wrestlers often consult several marabouts or fetishur, who are syncretic spiritualist guides whose knowledge can help them win the fight. While, while these Marabutic services are solicited in order to affect outcomes in many areas of life, including family issues, relationships, work, or school exams, they are of heightened importance in the sporting arena, where success and failure are so clearly demarcated. During a wrestling combat, the respective marabous are crouched in their chambers, uttering prayers and incantations counted on prayer beads. This is the climax of what is described as guerre mystique, a protracted campaign of mystical warfare which commences as soon as the combat is scheduled. The campaign involves spending vast sums of money on an arsenal of prayers, amulets, potions, and, amulet and animal sacrifices with wrestlers and their assistants often traveling vast distance in order to ar acquire arcane powers which can tip the balance in their favor. Sometimes these activities can take a sinister turn, 
Accusations and rumors abound of wrestlers desecrating the graves of their opponents' ancestors, of animals being buried alive, and even of human sacrifices. One marabou with whom I spoke, Serin Abdu, explained how he could send his jinn on the day of the combat in order to destabilize his client's opponent. In response, the other wrestler's marabou would have to mobilize his own jinn as a defensive measure, so jinn being a, um, a spirit. Uh, sometimes the ger mystique can take on the character of an actual turf war with gangs of young men barricading and patrolling entire neighborhoods ahead of a combat in order to ward off potential mystical incursions by the rival wrestlers' entourage. The role of Harfa Hufa in wrestling has proliferated in direct correlation to the sport's commercial expansion, and one of my interlocutors suggested that wrestling's increased media exposure is a driving force behind this boom in ostentatious and visible performances of mystique. Um, wrestlers at all levels spend vast amounts of money on Harfa Hufa and devote a great deal of time and energy to meticulously following the Marabou's orders. Young wrestlers try to emulate the established stars, not only by copying their names, techniques, or appearance, but also by imitating their pre-fight preparation. As young wrestlers sometimes seem to prioritize mystical preparation over training and other considerations, a variety of dissenting and critical discourses emerge. Per Ada, a former wrestler who turned coach, bemoaned the, excess, the excessive pouring of magical liquids pr prior to a fight, claiming that this is a mere spectacle which detracts from the technical aspects of the sport itself. Orthodox uh, imams frown upon such practices as being un-Islamic and hypocritical in view of the fact that the vast majority of wrestlers and their fans are practicing Muslims. A further critique uh, takes the form of a modernizing discourse which claims that mystical practices are guilty of, I quote from a newspaper article, plunging almost the whole country into a mystical obscurantism of the most retrograde kind. And the latter critique is often heard in the wake of outbursts of violence which continue to sully the sports image and are often the direct result of magical religious provocations. Um, so, so here we see a, a quote from uh, Sarsek, the uh, president of the Senegalese Football Association, saying that football should not become wrestling. Uh, it's this, it's a, this, this kind of modernizing zeal which motivated the, the soccer federation to ban all occult or marabutic practices from stadia in 2013. And in doing so, the federation's vice president, Sek, placed the sport in direct opposition to wrestling, stating that soccer should not become like wrestling. This constitutes a second type of mystical warfare, which I discussed today, the war on magical, magical religious practice itself. Like wrestling, the sport of soccer in Senegal is saturated in marabutage, and so players consult marabouts and they wear grigri under their shin pads. They hide magical objects in the goal. They solicit prayers which help them to score, and so on. While these practices remain highly visible in the immensely popular inter-district championships known as the Navitan, in other more formalized competition structures, they are highly discouraged. In one of the soccer schools where I conducted field work, the coach, Alain, would admonish his parents for wearing grigri or amulets and regularly tell them that their marabous would not bring them success. Only hard work and dedication would lead to success in soccer, with the goal being to earn a contract abroad, at preferably at a club in Europe. And so in Europe, the which is the preferred destination of most players, reliance on these traditional practices would be a hindrance and a distraction. Even more orthodox forms of religious practice were frowned upon in the context of the soccer pitch. For instance, players were not permitted to fast and train at Ramadan. They had to choose between either fasting or training. Furthermore, they were not permitted to skip training in order to participate in the, in the Grand Magal, which is a large pilgrimage in, in Senegal, and a central event in the calendar of the influential Murid Brotherhood. Um, Pap, a young soccer player who trains at the soccer school, flaunted these rules, happily showing me how he very convincingly feigned drinking water during Ramadan. So he would drink the water and let it sort of drip out the side of his mouth uh, without the coach noticing. So while he thus challenged what he perceived as an infringement of his religious freedom, his own interpretation of what it means to be a Muslim might be characterized as selective. While he insisted upon fasting and claimed to pray five times a day, we would sometimes drink a beer together. He agreed with his coach, Alain, that traditional beliefs and superstitions, as he said, represent a type of cultural baggage which can act as a burden in the world of European soccer to which he aspires. In the imaginary of the young Senegalese soccer player, European soccer is a highly rationalized and disciplined world in which hard work pays off and ancestral traditions are almost an embarrassing relic to be swept under the carpet. So here's a quote from, from Pap. My grandmother used to give me grigri to wear on my back, but
but I never wore them. I don't believe in that. But I won't say anything against people who do believe in it, because I am Senegalese, and it is our tra tradition. Sometimes my father takes me to Casamance to give me strength, and to give him strength in this kind of uh, magical, mystical sense. So we see an, a very ambivalent attitude here. Uh, in conclusion, both wrestling and soccer provide young men with hopes of economic success, even though these are quite slim. Beyond that, each sport provides a moral and ideological framework through which young men can grapple with a range of conflicting and contradictory subject positions. Soccer ostensibly espouses a worldview aligned with Western-inspired notions of professionalism and hard work, rejecting practices viewed as traditional or ancestral, and strictly limiting other types of religious life. Meanwhile, wrestling draws much of its appeal from its entanglement in syncretic religious practices. Its rootedness in village traditions and its de facto sta status as Senegal's national sport. So in French, they say le sport de chez nous. In Wolof, they say sunulamb. So here, uh, here I have used the, the metaphor of mystical warfare to highlight the tensions and fault lines which emerge at the convergence of sport and religion. So from the metaphysical battles fought by marabouts on behalf of wrestlers, to the very real and violent skirmishes between rival fans over mystical attacks, from the modernizing mission of the soccer authorities to Pap's defiant insistence on practicing his religion, sport reveals itself as a site of ideological and ontological contestation. While it is tempting to interpret the comparison of soccer and wrestling as the binary opposition of the global sport versus the local sport, the modern versus the traditional, the rational versus the mystical, the reality appears to be much more complex Wrestlers and soccer players alike occupy ambivalent positions with regard to the cosmologies associated with their respective disciplines. And finally, to, uh, just to allow my ethnography to make my final point for me, I return to my fieldwork notes on the Maributic consultation, which I attended with Moru, the wrestler. When the day of the 21st came around, I observed him hand out the 21 pieces of fruit as instructed. I saw the green cloth and I saw the mortar and I was assured that the black goat was well and truly dead. In the ring, Mordor defeated his opponent in less than one minute in a hugely one-sided contest. And afterwards, I asked him how he won. Was it the result of the Maributic preparation? And Mordor just looked at me like, like, I was, like I'd said something stupid, and he burst out laughing. He said, did you see the guy? Pointing at his opponent. He's even punier than you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark Han. And our next speaker is Uros Kovac, also from the University of Amsterdam. And the title of his talk is Athletic and Religious Bodies, Football and Charismatic Christianity Among Young Men in Cameroon. Uros Kovac. Okay, thank you very much, Adnan. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, so, with this presentation, hopefully, I will convince you in two key propositions. One is that studying religious practices in the context of sports can make significant, can make significant contribution to the anthropology of religion. And two, that looking into religious practices of aspiring athletes can tell us much about key concerns of young men from the global south who are dealing with uncertainty and deepening social and economic insecurity. Uh, so in Cameroon, as in many other parts of West Africa, football is by far the most widespread sport. Uh, Cameroon has been at the central stage of West African football for several decades. However, only since, uh, since recently, perhaps the late 1990s, has football started to play an, an important role in the ways that young men envision their future. Football has increasingly become a career option, uh, an option that promises possibilities of salaries that, that would allow young men to begin achieving adulthood by financially providing for themselves and their families. The opportunity for mobility is particularly attractive for young footballers. Migrating out of the country has become for young Cameroonians one of the most attractive and in many cases the most likely way to carve out a future. And football has become among young men the most desirable venue to do so. The young aspiring footballers dream of places afar. They detest the conditions in which they train in their own country and many are ready to migrate, to migrate at all costs. This has given rise to football academies that specialize in preparing the players for careers abroad. Uh, in the southwest region of Cameroon in particular, uh, Pentecostal Christianity has recently become highly present and has gained enormous visibility. Independent Pentecostal denominations have become a staple part of the religious scene in Cameroon, 
and new ones are being founded on a regular basis. Similarly to many other parts of the world, the Pentecostal churches distinguish themselves from other Christian denominations by emphasizing what can be termed as gifts of the Holy Spirit, so the gifts of prophecy and healing. Uh, regardless of the massive variety of denominations, most of them put emphasis on individual experience of the Holy Spirit, a strong bodily engagement with what they call the spiritual world through dancing, loud singing, and loud praying, uh, deliverances from evil spirits, and literal inter interpretations of the Bible. Uh, differently from older Pentecostal denominations that emphasize the ascetic lifestyle, the new version of what many term the prosperity gospel has been, has been uh, gaining ground since the beginning of the country's economic crisis in late 1980s and preaches the benefits of acquisition of material wealth. Young footballers consult the Pentecostal men of God, uh, the self-proclaimed prophets and evangelists who claim and often demonstrate their gifts of prophecy and healing. Now, the role of Pentecostalism in football in Cameroon is additionally significant, as football has long been considered, considered one of the key fields where witchcraft plays an important part. The stories of witchcraft in football range from those in which the footballers use what they call medicine, juju or jazz, uh, that's a pidgin English term for juju in uh, Cameroon and Nigeria, uh, which allows them to achieve amazing feats on the football field, to score glorious goals, to run with exceptional speed, or to guard the goal with a staggering consistency. At the same time, however, stories about witchcraft in football uh, narrate how the players attempt to harm an opposing players out of jealousy and cause them unexpected injuries that can end careers. When young footballers engage with Pentecostal denominations and the men of God, they seek to protect and distance, distance themselves from the instances of witchcraft that they see as dangerous. This is what many anthropologists of Christianity have called a rupture, a break away from and a strong opposition to what Christians call traditional practices. The importance, of, the importance of the discourse of rupture among Pentecostal Christians in Ghana was pointed out uh, by Birhet Meyer, for example, uh, even though she maintained that for Ghanaian Pentecostals the rupture is never a finished project, uh, but instead a constant struggle. And uh, recently anthropologists have more strongly emphasized radical rupture, uh, radical rupture as a central point, such as uh, Ruth Marshall and Joel Robbins, who in their analysis of Pentecostalism in Nigeria and Papua New Guinea respectively, emphasize the rejection of the past even more, arguing that anthropologists need to do away with what they see as obsessions with continuity. However, the practices of footballers show that it could be a mistake to think of Pentecostalism as simply a clear rupture with tradition. While this is a dominant discourse among footballers, there is more to this relationship. Most commonly, the footballers involve themselves with Pentecostal denominations in order to, as they say, tap the power of the Holy Spirit. The footballers often use Christian paraphernalia, such as anointed oil and holy water, uh, that they rub on their hands and their feet in order to reach goals quite similar to those expected to be reached through witchcraft, uh, those that have validation in the physical world. This immediate validation of the, uh, of the efficacy of Pentecostal Christianity and its promise of supremacy over witchcraft is perhaps its main appeal for the young footballers. Some older and more experienced players speak uh, how footballers used to use juju when playing, uh, and it brought them incredible energy and allowed them to perform amazing feats on the field. And now, uh, uh, as they say, uh, there is a recent proliferation of new Pentecostal tools, uh, such as anointed oil and holy water, uh, that, they that they can use in order to gain power and perform at, uh, at an even higher level. Some players emphasize how speaking the prayers aloud allows them to fill their bodies with the Holy Spirit, which then gives them a very physical result. It allows them to have energy for much longer and to be unstoppable in the field. So by engaging with the, uh, what they call the spiritual world, which is revealingly for Pentecostal Christians both a term for the realm of witchcraft as well as the realm of the Holy Spirit, the Pentecostal footballers are seeking to enhance their bodies and their athletic performances. In this way, and this is the key point of this section, uh, while through Pentecostal Christianity, the footballers distance themselves from what they call tradition, they also use Pentecostal tools in a similar way as they would use other spiritual paraphernalia to have direct consequences in the physical world and to gain power and perform miracles in the field. Still, the miraculous demonstrations of God's power are not the entire story. Uh, engaging with Pentecostal denominations for footballers also entails profound transformations of the self. 
the two key practices that stand out as central among footballers are blessing the newly acquired passports with anointed olive oil and deliverances uh, from evil spirits that stand for sexual temptations. So a footballer is keen to travel out of the country would bring their usually newly acquired passports to the man of God who would rub his hands with anointed oil and pray for the passports to be filled with a visa. And this highlights one of the key aspirations that uh, young footballers have. Uh, so a determination to migrate out of the country, but also recognition of the difficulty to achieve this. Uh, the young footballers recognize that opportunities to migrate are scarce, and they consider the assistance of the man of God as crucial to achieving this. The other practice revolves around sexual temptations. One of the most common problems reported to, to me by a man of God uh, who was particularly known among footballers was the issue of what he called a spiritual wife. A spiritual wife is a female evil spirit that can appear in men's dreams, a temptation in a, in a dream that makes men uh, ejaculate unwillingly and wake up in the, in the morning having wet their bed. It closely resembles the spirits of Mami Wata, uh, the spirits of sexual temptations that other anthropologists of Pentecostalism in Africa wrote about. For footballers, this kind of situation is especially considered dangerous as footballers and their coaches are quite concerned about keeping away from any sexual activity during the times of heavy training. According to them, ejaculation is an, as, is an enormous loss of energy with detrimental consequences on the field. It prevents the players from performing to their full potential and it makes them prone to serious injuries. This demonstrates how the spiritual world can have profound effects on the body and how spiritual practices are, are for Pentecostal Cameroonian footballers central to the maintenance of an athletic body. Furthermore, it demonstrates how the body of a religious athlete, so the athletic and the religious body, has a central place in the, in the construction of a moral person. The issues of spiritual wives and similar female evil spirits point to the footballers' fears of dangers of being unable to control their sexuality, which they see as harmful to their bodies that they maintain and use to achieve their goals. Participating in Pentecostal Christianity and consulting with the men of God is a way for the athletes to, ad to address the anxieties surrounding the difficulty of maintaining control over sexuality. Finally, the two issues I mentioned, so the lack of opportunities for mobility and dangers of sexuality, are for young footballers closely connected. Migration through football is, from the point of view of aspiring young athletes, but also their coaches and managers, a specific kind of migration, one that involves strict disciplining of gendered behavior. According to the stereotype of many in Cameroon, the footballers are known for living a sinful life, which means getting involved with many women and spending time in nightclubs, drinking and partying, and capitalizing on their status among their peers that only football can bring. Being involved in Pentecostal Christianity, with its emphasis on lifestyle based on self-discipline and monogamy, is a way of transformation of the subject in order to reach the desired goal of overcoming forced immobility and closure of borders. Pentecostal Christianity amongst footballers, while it does rely on demonstrations of miracles in the present and in the physical realm, it also involves long-term commitment that results in the formation and transformation of the subject, in this case, the aspiring male athletes striving for mobility against all odds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Urosh Kovac. Our next speaker is Daniel Guinness from the University of Amsterdam, and the title of his talk is A Trinity of Destinies, Faith, Ethnonationalism, and Raw Talent in Fijian Professional R Rugby Aspirations. Daniel Guinness. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Some hopes of the future are so strong that they, no, they not only reconstruct people's lives, but also can change whole societies. For Pio, who I met as a 24-year-old in Suva, rugby was his hope and dream for the future. He began each day with a long run, alone at dawn. He would then train with the team in the evening, and when he could afford it, he would go to the gym. After one of these gym sessions, I spoke with him, and I was trying to understand how, how he could continue with his training, how he could continue with his hard work despite all the difficulties. He, at that point, was unemployed and was relying upon his aunties uh, to give him money to, for food and also to, to train with. He replied, I have to trust in God's plan for me. I know that anything is possible through him. 
in paraphrasing Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, he told me that he needed to prepare the field in order to be ready for God to produce the harvest of blessings in his life. Now, many young Itaoke, uh, indigenous Fijian men, engage in frequent, difficult, unpaid rugby training, despite the uncertainty of the careers that it offers them. Rugby, since it was professionalized in 1995, has a global market for, for players. However, this requires the Fijians to travel overseas, ideally to the clubs located in top tier competitions in France, England, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Uh, here they might be able to earn enough to support their entire extended families, sometimes between $4,000 and $20,000 a month, which in comparison to the minimum wage in Fiji, which is $2, two Fijian dollars, uh, is extremely significant. However, un employment through rugby is very unpredictable. It's dependent upon recruitment by often unknown, unseen agents, contingent upon seemingly chance encounters, luck and subjective judgments. The vast majority of these young men will not achieve the dreams that they hope for. They know this, their families know this, yet many still prefer the uncertainty of rugby to the promises of education or even the guarantees of local employment. So how can we as anthropologists account for such certainty of action in such, towards such uncertain outcomes? Today I focus on three different ways that these young men and their families uh, understand and seek to control their futures. Firstly, many Fijians view the masculinized labor of rugby in terms of a warrior ideal, imagined as a nate to Atake men, part of their indigenous heritage. Secondly, young men draw upon an almost universal belief in a Christian God for a sense of a higher purpose in their lives. Uh, as part of what is becoming an emerging rugby theology, a collection of discourses, ideas, practices that connect godliness, moral discipline, and religiosity to his professional success. Thirdly, and increasingly, players, scouts, and coaches draw upon the received wisdoms of the professional market, which looks towards ideas of talent based upon genetics and pedigree. In each vision of this future, in different ways, uh, invokes con concepts uh, votes conceptions of outcomes that are predetermined, whether by God, ethnic identity, or genetics, forces which are, or seem to be at least, outside the control of individual agents and their families. In this sense, I argue that they, they act as destinies, ideas of destinies, ideas of unknown futures predetermined by forces outside of human agency. Drawing on several periods of fieldwork in Fiji, uh, and also overseas with Fijians playing in professional teams, I contrast these different conceptions, particularly in terms of the subjectivities and temporal outlooks they produce. Young Itaoke men regard themselves as a literal embodiment of a reified warrior ancestry, their strength and resilience born of, from many generations of hard physical work and warfare. Kinship relations are affirmed through regular visits between extended kin and the sharing of resources, particularly food. The Methodist Church, of which the, the majority of indigenous people are members, uh, reinforces these ideas about traditional ways of life. Sermons promote the, the recreation of a communal, uh, a communal relationship with God, imagined to have existed in the first moment of Christian conversion. This promotes a, a cyclical temporality contained within communal relations, whereby the future is a recreation of the past, or at least an imagined past. Hence, athletes begin to regard their bodies partly as their ancestral legacy, partly as the product of care and love, Loloma, uh, from family, clan, and uh, partly also as a product of their community. In all, in this context, being a man is bound to a bodily idea. By this logic, Italke men have a particular potential inherent within them, one which is believed to, give, believed to give them natural advantages in rugby. In the Fijian context of ethnic tensions, particularly between Italke men uh, between Atauke and Indo-Fijians, uh, who represent 54 and 38 percent of the population respectively. Rugby plays an important symbolic and social role in the articulation performance of the exceptionalism of indigenous Fijians. The success in global rugby reinforces the supposed naturalness of their moral and physical strength. However, most Fijian men, like Pio, look beyond these collective explanations to understand and control their futures. They look towards Christianity. Oseya Kolinisau begins each of his frequent acceptance speeches and interviews 
with a reference to the, to the work of God in determining the outcomes. What Fijians might call giving glory to God. Particularly since the sport was uh, professionalized in 1995, Fijian rugby has contained uh, many Christian prayers, sermons, and spiritual discussions. However, today, and they're, they're ecumenical to a certain degree. Um, however, today I'm going to focus on the Pentecostal, uh, Pentecostalism, and particularly on the changes that happen in terms of the subjectivity and temporality of the people engaged in Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism has really gained popularity in Fiji since the 70s and 80s, and it promotes a rupture with the past through rituals such as adult baptism, and it disturbs the individual patterns of subjectivities by focusing on the individual's relationship with God. For Pentecostals, they regard very significant events as part of God's larger vision for each individual person. In Fijian, nai naki naki nikelo, the will or intentions of God. This will is spoken of as being tailored to a particular gifts of the individual and therefore the best possible outcome that that individual could have in their life, their spiritual destiny. Adherents must carry out spiritual material labor of hope in order to fulfill these plans through regular participation in church, if through individual spirituality, as well as through careful moral uh, discipline, such as sexual abstinence out of marriage, and particularly from abstaining from uh, Yangona, the, a traditional uh, narcotic drink, and alcohol. Through these actions, it's not that they can influence the future or change the future, but rather they can find and fulfill their purpose. Currently, the professional coaches and elite coaches in Fiji as well as many players and managers, look for and desire what's called talent, which is a professional uh, idea within professional rugby of uh, a natural innate ability within a certain player. They understand success in many ways as being predetermined by genetics. When a player enters a professional rugby team, there's a barrage of biomechanical tests that are run on each of these young men. They're re repeated um, very routinely, some of these daily, in order to build up a picture not only of what a body can do, but what, of what a body will become given a particular training regime. Professional coaches within this framework imagine Pacific Islanders as being natural talent, as having flair, the X factor, and they hope that some of these young men will develop into players who can single-handedly win, win games. These conceptions reinforce the Fijian discourses that Fijians are naturally good at rugby. So much so that players are willing to go overseas to take on amateur contracts, uh, earning literally zero money, uh, in the belief that their natural abilities will come to the fore and get them success in professional teams at a later point. However, the enthusiasm of coaches is tempered by this idea that Fijians are also raw. They haven't been developed, they're ill-disciplined. They can't fit in with the structures on the field uh, and they have problems off the field. And so these ideas about predetermined talent begin to slip into ideas about, uh, about, the, the destined, uh, about these young men being destined for problems and not being able to fulfill their potential, which is a partial inversion of the Fijians' understanding of themselves. Most clubs now require professionalism, which is an emic description for an approach to training, preparation, and playing. Professionalism promotes, promotes self-responsibility, and athletes are turned, taught to channel their desires into hard physical training. This can lead to tensions with spiritual and corporal, between spiritual and corporal preparation. For the 2006 head coach, who was an atheist from New Zealand, uh, the players actually hid behind God, and his fatalistic understanding of Fijian spirituality, he saw that rather than take responsibility for their actions, they would say that it was God who determined that they lost, and therefore they didn't need to train. Yet in reality, the players are engaged in extensive physical and religious preparations, rather than merely waiting for their fate. During theologically inflected discussions, the 2006 coach's idea of uh, Samoans play rugby, Samoans pray as well, was often cited uh, by these young men, by the Fijian players themselves, along with phrases such as, God only helps those who help themselves, to justify not only the physical training they had to put in, but also the extent and lengths they went uh, to prepare themselves spiritually, such as with the, uh, the placing of um, biblical verses on their strapping tape, as pictured here. During the 2011 uh, Fijian national tour, the coach was a born-again Christian, 
And so spirituality became a core of team preparation. He would cancel training so that players could have prayer sessions, and he would encourage all players to get up before dawn to read the Bible. In his understanding, spirituality and God are active components of sport. They are potent. So, in conclusion, the ideas of the future begin to entwine with economic and social imperatives to shape their individuals' day-to-day -day choices about what they want to do with their lives and which, which particular paths they should pursue. Young men like Pio regard the professional contracts as being naturally and divinely sanctioned pursuits, fitting expectations of Italke men and their bodies. This is where destiny becomes important. Destiny builds upon hope. Uh, it, it offers a temporality and subjectivity uh, which goes beyond the passiveness of hope by, by giving it a sense of purpose, a morality. Destiny gives actions a sense of dignity that they would otherwise might not have, hence motivating and directing uh, these young men towards what are socially appropriate outcomes. Secondly, Professionalism and, and Pentecostalism both offer visions of the future in which Fijians are engaged in a new world uh, which is global. They are, they are engaged with it hopefully and with a sense of purpose. And this is very important in a time where the traditional or imagined traditional structures and social patterns are being undermined by the changing realities of a global economy. And finally, there are interesting depoliticizing effects here as Fijians consider their present and futures in terms of their own morality bodies, heritage, rather than as products of politics or material conditions. They, and because they see their salvation in individual terms, rather than a reconfiguration of society. Short-term problems, even catastrophic ones, are partly due to human failings. People therefore maintain their faith in this long-term destiny. This has significant consequences in the domestic economies, as it justifies powerfully the young men's choice to pursue rugby rather than to and be engaged in, in the local economy, which comes at a cost not only for themselves, but also for their, uh, their families, particularly their wives, many of whom are far more engaged within, uh, well, in supporting them um, through professional careers. So, for Pio, uh, this meant that he trained for, for eight years in total to try to become a professional rugby player, the whole time uh, living with his auntie and living off the, the money that his family provided to him uh, with the strong expectation that he would have an overseas career. And it was only after eight years and, and many failures um, that he eventually abandoned this and returned to his village uh, to take up a different life and to recreate the, the cycle um, within the village there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel Guinness. Our next speaker is Sebastian Fuentes from the University of Amsterdam, and the title of his talk is Traditional Values and New Futures of Youth, Personal Catholic Experience and Team Spirit Among Privileged Rugby Players in Buenos Aires. Thanks, Adnan. During field work among young men from upper middle and upper class families in Buenos Aires, belonging to Catholicism was an important issue for them to deal with. Rugby had been introduced in Argentina by English Protestant families, but at the beginning uh, of the 20th century, wealthy families related with the migrant English one by the means of marriage, uh, sharing education in private schools, or learning how to play some of the sports they brought. Rugby was quickly considered as an important social practice because wealthy local families constructed European, French, or English symbols as a sign of distinction. Protestant English families were integrated into the major Catholic elite local families, and rugby became one of the major means towards the production of moral men. In this presentation, I address how these young rugby players, or rugby as they call themselves, uh, combine religious practices, convictions, and their passion for this sport. 
They try to engage with their inherited religious and class belonging and develop a leadership position and a reflective subjectivity using religious beliefs and emotional experience and their sport practices and symbols. The production of neoliberal subjectivity is at the core of this junction between sport and religion. All the young men I met have attended a private Catholic school. Like Gustavo, a rugby player who was deeply committed with religion, but not in an odd or old way, he warned me during an interview. Not emphasizing doctrine, but trying to make an everyday experience of God's presence. For that, he meant living in peace, trying to be a good person, with discretion and respect to the others. Although he had gone to a Catholic private school, his religious convictions were not developed there. This new way of living religion was taught to him during his participation in a group of Catholic rugbyers. It is a Catholic movement where rugbyers go off to a spiritual retreat. During their retreat, they feel like the world crashes and quakes, they told me, because of the emotional impacts of the talks. The lectures, are given by other young guys and girls who have taken part in the same retreat before. These talks are called testimonies, for the speeches are centered uh, on their personal experience, not only on what the Bible says. Some of the most shocking moments that they told me involve testimonies about the families. The testimony is centered on the anger and mistreatment grown in parent-children relationships and forgiveness. As a surprise, at the end of the talk, they receive letters written by their relatives. That is the moment for crying. At the same time, the initiative is filled with symbols that combine religious elements with sport images like the institutional logo, a cross inside a rugby ball. During the retreat, they learn how to feel the presence of God in their everyday intimacy. After the spiritual retreat, some of them keep meeting in an encounter and group that they call Scrum. Scrum is the rugby formation where eight players of each team form in three lines. The ball is thrown along the line that connects the opposite teams, and they must push and try to lead the ball with their feet to their own side in order to catch it and play it. For Argentinian uh, rugbyers, Scrum is not only sport formation. It is a symbol of the unity and alliance to the peers that rugby fosters as a modern sport. A rugby player uh, told me, during scrum, you trust your life to your teammate. Any wrong movement may put someone else at risk. At risk. During scrum, they feel the team spirit, and that's what they say about the Catholic scrum group. Team spirit allow these rugbyers to translate the bodily and emotional and collective dimension from rugby to Catholicism, for it signals the prominence given to the group. Young people develop an interpretative practice in those groups, producing subjectivities which are constantly aware of their actions, emotions, and regulate themselves with support from the group. As Gustavo told me, it is a way of assessing your life your priorities, and talk about what your concerns are. The members exert a mutual control over the decisions as well, so it works as a means to control their imagination about the future they want, but at the same time, this imagination is cultivated. Within these groups, they work on their individual autonomy and some values promoted by amateur rugby and local Catholicism, such as individual sacrifice and commitment to the group. Hermeneutic work is done in current capitalist societies where individuals search for some structuration of their everyday lives, building, uh, as this case shows, a strong personal relation with God. In Latin American context, this type of religious experience has been encouraged since a couple of decades ago, and I frame this in a major political regarding of religion. This type of religious experience is inspired in the prominence given to the baptized people by the Vatican Concilium II in the 60s, meaning that the baptized play an important role in church. But since the 80s, uh, some Catholic, uh, Catholic institutions have been highlighting the individual experience of religion. 
As some of my informants told me, every baptized person is supposed to sanctify their everyday living, doing ordinary things as if they were blessed, thinking about God, praying, and helping those in need. As some Latin American scholars discover these modes of contemporary Catholicism were developed by important lay movements and institutions like Opus Dei. It is a religious group that is spread to upper class families all across the subcontinent, including these families where rugbyers belong to. It is recognized as an elite group which supports uh, what are considered orthodox Catholic moral values such as the fight, uh, fight against abortion, the defense of the private property, the liberty and the family, the freedom and the family, the avoiding of premature sexual relationship, etc. The stress of the moral dimension now is not enough, so these groups related to local elites develop new strategies to reach young men giving spaces for the individual experience of God. A few years later, I found Gustavo in a photo on online media. He had become a rugby referee one of the jobs that is growing fast as the rugby is professionalizing in and finding new publics, sponsors, and economic resources. Still, he was committed with Catholic rugby groups. What Gustavo and his stations, intentions enlightened are the political links between subjectivity, sport, and religious experience, which enact the relevance of group experiences in the current lives and the futures of young men transformation in the works of market labor, the rise and the ups and downs of neoliberal policies in Argentina, the global shift of the economy, and the intensified movements of people, images, and resources also affect the way young men from upper middle and upper classes in Argentina build and dream of their future. The growth of sport professionalization touches the core of the social and moral reproduction of the male members of these wealthy families. New futures are offered currently in the same sport their fathers played only as amateurs, and the process of choosing trajectories, including the sporting one, is entangled with anxiety, doubts, hopes, and unsolved ways of finding their place as individuals who are searching for success or at least a wealthy and happy future. The search for success is commonly criticized as selfishness, and tensions arises between these young men's individuality and the importance given to family, friends, and community, as is the expectation of their parents. The resolution of these tensions involves religious convictions and sport practice as well. Some of these young men want to believe, but not as dogmatic doctrine center or morality as their parents did. The junction of rugby and Catholic practices convey meanings and spaces where young men can imagine and solve, uh, can imagine their future and solve the problem of the reproduction of their families, Catholicism and traditional values, recreating them through personal experience. Moreover, in these practices, they can deal with the issues of believing and meaning by using the sport configuration and the religious belief in order to produce the leader and the type of leadership that is required in contemporary capitalism. The links between religion and sport in the production of neoliberal subjectivity is well explained by Pichot's autobiography. Pichot is a former rugby player who leads the professionalization of the sport in Argentina. Talking about the priest, who dealt with his questioning of the Catholic Church in high school, he stated, instead of kicking me out and expelling me, Father Castañet said, we have to convince Agustin so he play for us. With no doubt, putting the people onto your side is a smart way of leading, end of quote. Religious relationships work as if they were sport training which prepare you for the role of leading. Sport Sports and religion are means to foster and frame individuality and a leadership position. If some of these young men had a dogmatic teaching about religion that made them reject or downplay Catholic convictions, the Scrum Initiative with Friends may help them engage in a meaningful practice. Then they play Catholicism as if it were the sport they feel passion for, and they pray in rugby as if it were a religion. 
the expansion of religious experience and symbols to sport groups like Our Lady of Rugby, present in many clubs, enhance the possibility of Catholic values to adapt to new modes of believing, articulating a relationship between conservative moral movements and the emotional experience of the young men. The personal Catholic experience goes hand in hand with team spirit. The relevance given to the team is combined with competing and winning, meaning the group or individual success. Playing and praying is a way to reframe traditional values and imagine new futures, facing anxieties and doubts. Team spirit is one of the most recognized values in the world of local and transnational companies, always searching for new leaders, new ways of governing uh, organizations and societies, and new flexible job positions worldwide. The team spirit is a symbol of neoliberal subjectivity that combines the, the relevance given to the team with the possibility of individual success. This value is now blessed as a sacred one. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. And our next speaker is Carmen Riel from the University, Federal University of Santa Catarina. And the title of her talk is The Brazilian Football Players, Global Pastors of Neo-Pentecostal Religions. Thank you, Adam and also Dan and Nico for put together such a great group. I'm very happy to be here. It's the panel of my dreams. Uh, I, I've been researching football for the past 20, uh, 12 years. Not of the sport itself, but using the sport, if this change, oh good, it works to tackle social issues, mobility, migration, circulation, changes in gender relations, security and securization, and changes of the religion landscape in Brazil. Authors such as Marcel Moss, Clifford Gertz, and Roberto da Mata have significantly shaped theoretical perspectives on religion and sport. But more recent efforts to define and understand the category of religion are yet to fully penetrate the realm of athletics. Perhaps, as Talar Azad advised, it will be interesting to look at actual practice more than cosmologies. Here, I will focus the analysis on the meaning of faith, a persistent native category and some forms of express, expressions used to displace faith, words, gestures, and body marks. Besides highlighting visual tropes of faith exhibited by football players in public spaces, this presentation aims to disclose the relationship of neo-Pentecostal practice and masculinity. A rapid con contextualization, the religion landscape in Brazil has dramatically changed in recent years. Christianity used to be synonymous of Catholicism in the country, but no longer is. There has been a meteoric rise of evang evangelic denominations and notably by of neo-Pentecostal churches. One of every four Brazilians now identifies themselves as evangelic the larger ma majority are Pentecostals. Uh, the, you see, we see the, the growth of the Pentecostals in, in Brazil. This change has an important consequence, not only in the private lives of the believers, but also in urban space. In the mediscape, the country's second largest network belongs to a neo-Pentecostal leader, and the political arena, Congressmen were elected as evangelicals and attack L LGBT and abortion rights. One of the most visible arenas for religion to preach today are sport-related spaces. By expressing their faith to large audience, players have become Christian global missionaries. Faith. 
During my conversation with Brazilian football players, when I asked about religion, players often correct me saying, it's not religion, but faith that matters in, the, in, in our lives. Thus, the definition of faith, this de definition of faith, uh, this, it fits the way of, they, the way they see faith. Faith is an abstract concept that is expressed by players in specific forms, words, gesture, and corporal marks. Corporal marks. In several religions, at the time of an initiation ritual, believers receive a mark on their bodies to remind them of the special bond that they now have with the divinity. There are no such rituals in Christianity. Traditional baptism was use only water which flows away, but the need for material marks persists and it's replaced by tattoos. Tattoos along with other forms of, such as pendants, chains with crucifies, are seen as works that reaffirm faith because as expressed in a belief, faith without works are dead. The player's body becomes billboard of the Christianity serving to propagate faith. Tattoos serves to make their faith present and show it to the others. They display a material proof of their faith as a pledge of loyalty, a daily reminder, a, a way of, a, to avoid the breaking of the bound that would bring punishment and disgrace. They also construct a narrative of a different subjectivity, indicate a man who is guided by Christian ethical and moral principles. Gestures. There are a variety of countless small rituals that athletes conduct before, during, and after each game. The most recurrent being the rising of their rain to the sky in celebrating a goal. Sometimes this gesture is made in, by kneeling. Christianity does not hold a monopoly on relations with the divine in football. More recently, players have appeared bowing and kneeling in the Muslim position. These gestures can be interpreted as acknowledgments that the goals are a gift from God. The goal is a proof of a reciprocal fidelity of the believer towards God and of God toward the believer. It's not, only, it's not only an individual achievement, but also the result of God's will. Ter fé, to have faith, is an expression frequently used by Brazilian players that it's loaded with meanings, one of them being loyal, loyalty. Words. Faith expresses itself in lo loyalty, but also in obedience. Even when a believer does not have a specific task to accomplish, they feel obligated to obey the laws of God expressed in the Bible. They usually refer to the Bible as the word. Daily reading of the Bible is mandatory, but they also promote meeting at their houses or in hotel rooms during away matches in encounters with pastors. Some of them describe the, in, inscribe their words on their flesh, or they send by Twitter. May God bless and protect us, is the phrase that Neymar sent to millions before each match. If you open today the Twitter of Neymar, you are going to find the phrase and also a picture of his son. Frequently, those who already know the word take the microphone in the church and give testimony of their own life experience, usually telling about how they used to live a life of debauchery involving alcohol and brothels, and how this all changed after their encounter with Jesus. As in the case of Joe, who was dispensed by a formal club for bad behavior, later converted and now reads the Bible, like thousands 
of football players, Joe preached a life of obedience to the word. Obedience implies a certain moral behavior in conformity with the divine rules. It represents a profound change in the so socially expected conduct for men from the lower social class in Brazil. By embracing faith, men, new men are made involved in the core of their masculinity. Masculinity. As Connell and Godelier have noted in their studies of masculinity, the formation of men in New Guinea contains various stages. A separation of young boys from women, mothers, sisters, possible lovers, reclusion in a house for men where they observe the sperm of older men and are submit to painful rituals, and a return to the society with another social status, no longer that of children. It is a process compared to a second birth. Women make boys through pregnancy and parturition. Men make other men through the exchange of sperm. Footballers also leave their family at very young age to dwell in a house with men, the so-called concentration. In this house of men, their hegemonic masculinity is constructed. The making of the body and the spirit of evangelical football players is a long process of inculcation of habitus. It's not easy to get rid of the hegemonic masculinity since it is a social obligation to perform the debauch acts prescribed, such as copious drink, recurrent visit to nightclubs, and even warehouses, and a wild sexual life. In some ways, we see the making of men, of their minds, with, and that has an outstanding consequence for their body. I'll, I'll give you an example. Pato, a famous Brazilian football star, recently told a story that exemplifies the dilemma involving the choice of masculinity. Quote, when I arrived at Milan very young in the locker room, Ronaldo showed me a Playboy magazine asking if I wanted to enter his group or if I preferred to join Kaká's group pointing to some religious things, unquote. Faith as, ex as experience, especially the ne neo-Pentecostal experience, in which the Holy Spirit possessed the body of the believer, legitimately allowed men to be less manly. A new status is attained, that of fathers or sons, rather than conspicuous lovers. Thus, the evangelical practice produce not only athletes, but also produce men who are freely to, uh, to allow to display a socially non-hegemonic masculinity. But careful, among fans who often chant homophobic slogans, the new habitus may come with a risk of being, of being perceived as homosexual behavior. One possible output is paternity. To display a self-identity as a father, a mainly man capable of reproduction and a simultaneously being a caring father. Never before have so many football players depict themselves as fathers. They appear with sons, fewer daughters are shown celebrating victories, taking them to school, helping with the homework, in the kitchen, sleeping on the couch or in bed, and even bathing together. Final considerations. What does faith mean to them? Faith is lo loyalty, fidelity, submission, hope. It's a reliability of divine providence in providing prosperity, an expectation for future blessing, as well as an explanation for past achievements. 
Although all these meanings of faith are present in their religion practice, a central reference is faith as experience, an experience capable of changing men into fathers, or, as Ronaldo put it, from playboys to believers, from playboys to dads. That's it. Uh, thank you very much, Carmen. Um, now I would like to invite um, Susan Brownwell from the University of Missouri, uh, St. Louis, to come and discuss the papers. Thank you very much. But also I would like to um, draw your attention to another panel um, called Gambling with Uncertainty, Transnational Mobility and the Global Sports Industry this coming Saturday. Um, you know, so it would be very nice if you have time to come and also listen to us there. Thank you very much. Having just spent two weeks in Rio last summer with my collaborator, Nico Besnier, this panel reminds me of the Olympic Games where for most of the events, large, huge arenas have only a handful of fans in the seats, while 70% of the world's population has access via the television broadcast and the internet streaming. So for any of our fans out there who are tuning into the live stream, welcome to our media event. <laughs> This panel takes up an issue that lies at the core of modernity, but until now it's never been theorized in a satisfactory way, nor indeed has it even been researched fully by ethnographers. And that question is, what is the relationship between sport and religion? The question lies at the core of modernity because of the fact that sport in many ways has either become one of the most important religions of modernity or it's replaced religion or something else depending on how one sees it. Of course there are jokes about soccer as a religion and in some countries such as China mega events have become something like a ritual of state just as important as for example the military parades on national day. And at the global level, the International Olympic Committee and FIFA preside over sport mega events that have become the premier rituals of global society. However, we can't even make these assertions with certainty due to the current backward state of theory about the relationship between sport and religion. There is still no consensus among anthropologists or sports scholars that sports mega events are rituals or that soccer can be mentioned in the same breath as a religion such as Christianity. It's obvious even to observers who have no doctorate in anthropology that there is a similarity between sport and religion or sport and ritual, but we still don't have a consensus on what that similarity is. So let me pause to briefly review where anthropological theory has been on this point so that, that I can get to where we are now in order to show why I think these research projects are so important. So from 1974 to 1982, four symposia were sponsored by the Winter Gren Foundation for Anthropological Research. Uh, and for those who might not know, these symposia, which continue to this day, are intended to treat important topics that will chart new paradigms in the discipline, as these arguably did. The first symposium was organized by Max Gluckman, Sally Moore, and Victor Turner, and included many other luminaries of the time, such as Irving Goffman, Jack Goody, and Terence Turner. The resulting book was Secular Ritual, published in 1977. The challenge of the conference was to break through the traditional assumption that rituals must be connected with religious or magical procedures, that is, with the realm of supernatural powers. The conference and the book asked, what new material becomes visible if the supernatural element is stripped away and this worldly ceremonies and their outcomes are considered? The notion that there are rituals that are not fundamentally religious was a bold assertion at the time, and it opened up the possibility that secular ritual, as they called it, might include sport. However, this group of theorists 
always stopped short of fully including sport within their paradigm. In, in the book that resulted from that conference, Max and Mary Gluckman directly took up the question of whether sport should be considered a secular ritual, and they concluded that it should not. Sports are sometimes held in conjunction with rituals. They're governed by formal and conventional rules like rituals. They embody moral principles like rituals, but they lack the, quote, confidence in ultimate mystical effect, unquote, that characterizes rituals. This would be Gluckman's last publication. He died shortly after the symposium. Victor Turner also excluded sport from his, um, what he called his liminal genres. He preferred to make a distinction between truly liminal phenomena, by which he meant rituals in pre-modern and agricultural societies, versus liminoid phenomena, performance genres such as theater, sport, music concerts, and so on in industrialized societies. He felt that sports were generally a kind of ceremony by which he meant an event that merely confirmed the social order and did not possess liminal qualities. That is to say, they didn't bring about transitions, social transitions. A second Wintergren Symposium was held in 1977 it was organized by Victor Turner, Barbara Meyerhoff, and Barbara Bag Babcock. It resulted in the book edited by John McAloon, Wright Drama Festival Spectacle. So while Gluckman and Turner had concluded that sports are not rituals, McAloon's theory of ramified performance genres offered an explanation of what sports actually are. He discussed the different frames that might surround sport mega events spectacle, festival, ritual, and games. For him, sports fell within the frame of the game. And although they might be surrounded by rituals, such as opening ceremonies and medal ceremonies, they were not themselves rituals. Working independently in the same time period, historian Alan Gutman put forward his from ritual to record theory in a book of the same name. He outlined a unilinear evolution of modern sport out of so-called traditional ritual practices. So, like Gluckman and Turner, he saw a clear separation between sport and ritual, which reflected the difference between tradition and modernity, which he also conceived in stark black and white terms, as did Gluckman and Turner. So he reflected a viewpoint that persists today, which is that international sport is somehow quintessentially modern. Anthropologist Henning Eichberg disagreed that ritual had been stripped from modern sport. He argued that in fact the pursuit of records and outstanding performances had made sport into what he called a ritual of the record. However, uh, Eichberg's work is generally not very well known. So 40 years later, that is pretty much where we stand today. In the postmodern turn of the 1980s, ritual theory was largely put aside, and there it stagnated. McAloon and Eichberg had gotten us to an acknowledgement that there is no clear black and white line between sport and ritual and religion. But as yet, we have no theory constructed from the opposite assumption. This set of papers, by contrast, is constructed from the opposite assumption. As the panel abstract stated, this panel is constructed around the assertion that religious practice and athletic endeavor have often been closely intertwined. So what is really wonderful about these papers, especially in this day and age where theory often drives ethnography rather than the other way around, is that each author has started by doing very good intensive ethnography. This has enabled them to see the relation of sport to religion from the inside out. From that perspective, it is clear that in the everyday practices of their informants, sporting and religious practices are seamlessly connected. Sebastian Fuentes's rugby players say that they sanctify the everyday living. Fuentes observed, observes, they play Catholicism as if it were the sport they feel passion for, and they pray in rugby as if it were a religion. 
Daniel Guinness finds sport and religion in Fiji so interconnected that he coins the term rugby theology. He finds that Pentecostals and Methodists practice variations on this theology, but they are both shaped with a concern about controlling destiny. Carmen Rial's description of the religious practices of soccer players in Brazil has a slightly different emphasis on faith rather than destiny, but there's still a future orientation here because faith implies the expectation that providence will provide future prosperity and blessings. Uras Kovac finds a similar focus among young male soccer players from Cameroon who are dealing with deepening social and economic insecurity. In these examples, the insecurity and uncertainty in the lives of the young men um, is partly drawn from the precarity of the global economy because they hope to make it in professional leagues and perhaps immigrate to wealthier countries where they can earn bigger paychecks for themselves and their families than they could if they were at home. Mark Hahn finds that the young Senegalese men who compete in traditional wrestling employ the services of marabous, whose mix of traditional magic and religion will ensure their success at a local level, a success that goes beyond the contest and assures the athlete and his kin high standing in the village. So they are also attempting to control their destinies. Um, and an additional focus um, is also seen in the attraction of Pentecostalism in Fiji, Brazil, and Cameroon, where it is seen as a way of helping young men control their sinful ways and ultimately attain respectable masculine norms. So taken together, these points, uh, th these papers lead to a point that I reached a long time ago. At least in the realm of sports studies, the category of religion is not helpful. It should be discarded along with its associated dichotomies, the secular and the sacred, scientific rationality and magical thinking, and so on. We know that these categories are the product of Western culture with its specific history in which religion and science became opposed, along with a whole string of associated oppositions, such as the modern versus the traditional, rationality versus superstition. This binary underlay modernization theory and it underlay the theories of Gluckman, Turner, and Gutman. It was this fundamental dichotomy that made George Gemelch's famous essay on baseball magic so popular. It titillated the reader by claiming that in a thoroughly modern, in quotes, modern sport like American baseball, the players were actually engaging in magical practices similar to traditional Trobrian Islanders. However, all of this is a false dichotomy that simply needs to be discarded. This is illustrated by the papers that describe conflicts between varieties of religious practice and sports. So for example, Senegalese traditional wrestling is permeated with magical practices, and uh, for the most part that is acceptable, while in the realm of soccer there has been an attempt to stamp them out. In sports like rugby and soccer that are hooked into international sports systems dominated by Western cultural frameworks, there are sometimes conflicts between spirituality and professionalism when religious practice is seen to contradict scientific principles of training. However, as Han warns us, it may be tempting to see this as the binary opposition of the global sport versus the local, but the reality is more complex. He points out that wrestlers and soccer players alike occupy ambivalent positions with regard to the cosmologies associated with their disciplines. And Rial is heading in the same direction when she argues that we need to look at actual practice rather than cosmologies. So taken as a whole, these papers show us that local magical practices and practices linked with world religions and the ideology of scientific professionalism are all ways of dealing with uncertainty, attempting to control destiny and luck, constructing a respectable masculine subject, and assuring an athlete's social position. Conflicts between different sets of practices are just disagreements about their efficacy. 
It's not helpful to call one of them traditional and the other modern, or one of them secular and the other religious. Through their careful ethnography, the authors have answered the question, is sport a form of religion? The answer is that the question is not worth asking as posed. Practices intended to control luck and destiny and to create masculine men are inherent in many sports. Some of these may be called religious, some not. So if I were to provide a critique of these papers, I would push all of them to try, to, uh, try even harder to see the world from the point of view of their informants and not to impose these unhelpful Western categories. Situate sport in the entire set of activities believed to have efficacy in controlling fate. Don't cordon off religion and give it special status. I'd like to see a little bit more attention to the question of what exactly religion or spirituality means to these young men. I mean, just one example is Guinness's focus on destiny um, raises a question with me because you never give the indigenous Fijian term for destiny. And for me, I'm, I'm not sure if you're giving me your own outsider analysis or whether this is the insider you know, viewpoint of, your, of the athletes. So um, anyway, probably the abstract category of religion per se has very little meaning to any of your informants. So then the interesting question is to unpack what notions do have meaning to them and why sport, of all things, is seen to embody that meaning. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think now we have an open discussion. So, yes. I, yeah, very interesting question. I, I, I think, I think these, these divisions become less clear actually in the practices, uh, particularly in around um, teams. Um, and there's, there's a degree that uh, uh, a lot of the Methodist traditions, particularly the songs, um, the, uh, this communality exists within, within the Pentecostal churches any, in any case, and particularly within, within the team environments. Um, where, yeah, where the, the worship services that the teams will do together will involve, uh, e even if being led by a Pentecostal person, will still involve these, uh, these, um, well, these Methodist uh, rituals and, uh, and songs. Um, when, when you start to look at how people imagine themselves uh, overseas, um, yeah, there, there's... There's perhaps some differences, but no, it's, it's, not, as, it, it's not as clear cut as the players who are Pentecostal when they go overseas purely see themselves as being individuals as abstracted from the, the communal setting. Um, you, they'll still, uh, still be maintaining those, those ties with home and uh, still be um, uh, engaged in exchange practices and with, uh, through remittances and also um, uh, sending back of goods. Uh, so no, I, I don't think I don't think that division is as stark as uh, as what I had to present it in in such a short format as this morning. There, the, the, the athletes are, uh, 
working year around. Uh, they get scholarships. They're not necessarily the poor country, but get to the NFL. Uh, but there, it's the coaches measure them in everything, in the weight room, in the conditioning. Everything is competitive. Uh, is do you see that sort of as the set? And that depends whether they're going to play on Saturday in front of the TV or not. Do do you see that as the same thing as using religion to kind of instill um, a sense of teamwork? and discipline to play better. Uh, do you see those as sort of the equivalent? Thank you, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, question, my observation. Uh, well, I think that there is a laic practice, and we can also see this laic practice acting uh, in a group. Sometimes, and, and this has a, 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 a connection with uh, the religion practice, like uh, uh, we call self empowerment uh, but uh, I mean maybe it's the coach maybe it's a psychologist we, uh, this week uh, just came out a picture that I think it's very relevant and talks a, a, a little bit about that it, it shows Cristiano Ronaldo he's tall and another football player and in the middle there is a a psychologist, uh, a young girl who they uh, perceive as a person who made them play better. So can be the coach, can be a psychologist, can be a Mahabodhatu or a neo-Pentecostal pastor. Uh, what we are trying to say that, that, what I am trying to say is that it's not the same Sports are, doesn't build the same masculinity. Each sport builds a different masculinity or femininity or whatever. A build, build a different ethos. And religion builds different ethos. And laicity also. And laicity also has to be encompassed. No? Uh, laicity in France. Uh, 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 <laughs> have a meaning very different from the, the non religions in the United States. No? Like stay in France uh, today is, means exclusion, uh, well, uh, anti Muslim practice. Uh, uh, doesn't have the same meaning in Brazil. So I think that uh, the, the way that we all try to do is that doing field work, talking with the people, seeing what means for them is still uh, a better way, and then dialoguing with the, the students. The, the 2011 head coach of the Fijian uh, development team had this uh, perspective that actually, I'm not sure whether he coined it or whether he merely um, told it to me, because I heard it all around as I, as I traveled to New Zealand and Australia in particular. And that is that, that rugby, uh, as seen by, by some Fijians, consists of three, three factors in preparation. Firstly was the physical preparation, which is the training, which is all these things you've just spoken about. Uh, you know, and that I speak about in terms of professionalism. And I, I link to these ideas as they flow from, um, uh, from the clubs, in, uh, particularly in New Zealand and Australia, but also England and France. You know, particular techniques, particular understandings of, uh, well, of physiology and, and preparation. Uh, the second part that he spoke about was mentality, uh, you know, which is the psychologist. Uh, and then the third part was spirituality. And in his emphasis, there were, there were potentially all effective ways of preparing. But for him, the spiritual was the only way that Fijians could have an advantage over anybody else. So he saw these other two as being, yes, they're necessary. Yes, we need to do this, this training. But 
we don't have the resources, we don't have the time together uh, to develop physically or mentally, and so we're going to focus on the spirituality. Um, which I think answers this, this question that you're asking about how they regard these different practices. As in, in his perspective, he'd regard them as all, as, as all being potentially uh, effective. However, that was his perspective, um, and a, a prominent one, a powerful one in that, in that context. But even within that team, there were young men who, when I spoke to them, as I think Mark captures in, in his, his discussion, uh, would avoid some of these spiritual prescri uh, prescriptions on their life, as they would also avoid some of the, the physical ones. You know, they wouldn't follow the diet, uh, and some of the boys decided to sleep in rather than pray. Um, some people were, uh, yeah, they, they were resistant to the prayers. They had to go along with them, um, because of not only was it the coach who explicitly said, if you're not Christian, you're not on this team. Those, those dreams are over. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, there also was an expectation from the players uh, who would look at each other's degree of spiritual involvement and commitment and would start to point fingers if the team failed. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it was, um, I don't know, Johnny, Johnny is not praying in the mornings. That's why we lost. Uh, so, on one hand, yes, they're all the same thing. Uh, this spirituality, this mentality, this, this physicality, uh, but these, these different ideas about what, what is effective have a degree of power that is context dependent. Um, and in this particular case, it's not the context isn't just Fijian rugby players, but it's rather those personalities, those figures of authority who happen to have influence at that moment uh, within, a, within a particular squad or team. This is a question for Susan. Um, <laughs> I, I quite agree with you um, when you say that we need to rethink the boundaries between such things as uh, religion and uh, uh, other things, but at the same t in the sense that uh, uh, Brazilian, Fijian uh, sports people uh, do not see that there, there are boundaries, but they do see boundaries between themselves as Christians and others. Uh, so I think that there is still a sense in which uh, in, the, in the local uh, configuration of things, these boundaries actually have some social significance. And I was wondering if you could comment on this. Yeah, just close this. Ah, sure enough. Uh, yeah, to, just to bring up a sort of, you know, very old paradigm, the emic and the etic, or, you know, the insider and the outsider view. Yes, I mean, I can imagine that um, religion, and maybe um, not conceived as, you know, an abstract category per se, maybe a specific religion, does have meaning, you know, in the lives of the athletes. So I, th I think that's what we need to concentrate on and not the, um, I, I think the, the, just the concept of the religion, uh, the concept of religion as, you know, a category that we analyze as anthropologists is so powerful that sometimes it's just hard to let it go as an edit category and just pay attention to what it means as an emit category. So I, I think that's, you know, I would um, support you on, on that point. And I, I did just feel that um, some of the papers hadn't quite let go of the edit category totally, you know, in the analysis to really unpack what was going on at the emic level. So, you know, that was the point I wanted to encourage all of you to be attentive to. So if we retain it as an edit category then, the question that emerges is, how is the study of religion within a sporting context different from studying religion in any other setting? Yeah, that could be a very interesting and complicated debate to get into. I mean, I'm a sports studies scholar and it's just after, you know, many decades of thinking about the relationship between sport and religion, I just started feeling that it's just not a helpful question. 
So, um, and, and I think because I do believe that sport sometimes can give us a very interesting entree into everyday practice. I think that's particularly what we saw on this panel. We're talking about body practice, everyday practice. Um, so some, sometimes that's a great entree for really seeing more clearly what the problem is with these you know, broader categories and approaches. I, I think that's what's going on here. I think that what we see, this problem with religion as a category, <coughs> applies to all studies of religion. <coughs> However, since I, I don't generally do religious studies, I won't you know, stand by that 100%, but that, that is what I think is probably going on. Uh, I agree completely, uh, but uh, we have to start from somewhere. And my first paper about the relation between religion and sport, I start by asking that. I, is football a religion? It's uh, soccer uh, a religion? Uh, and if it, it is, what's the difference? What kind of religion it is? And I gave up that question very quick because it didn't make sense. And, and here today, I started saying in my interviews, the first question is, uh, one of the questions was, what, what about your religion? And they, the players felt to me it doesn't make sense to ask me that. Uh, religion is not important. Religions make a lot of things bad in the world. Uh, what matters is faith. And that's why I wrote about faith. I mean, uh, this is what I, I think it's, it's correct. Uh, the cooperation, like uh, the, the, the Wanner Green uh, secular ritual, the, 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 these books uh, and, and some articles, the, the cooperation between ritual and uh, sport, really, uh, I think Roberto da Mata uh, throw everything uh, away. There's a paragraph that he, he wrote that's very, very good. <laughs> and synthesize this discussion. No? You say, well, okay, if, if football is a religion, is a ritual. Uh, so what, what, why, why keep calling football and not ritual? Why, why keep calling ritual? I mean, uh, let's make the things uh, separate because then they are going to have more meaning and, uh, and let's look the practice. Um, so, yeah, maybe one way of, of uh, not uh, uh, moving away from this concept of religion or just trying to make it a little bit more emic, uh, one way is maybe to, uh, um, to look at the concept of spirituality as the, the way that it is used by our informants, our participants. So, for example, my participants never, uh, the Pentecostal Christian footballers never really refer to their Pentecostal practices as religious practices but instead as spiritual practices, in fact, they, uh, those practices were, as, uh, were in opposition to religion, which they saw as sort of an institution with dogmatic rules. But on the other hand, what they were experiencing and doing, and what they saw themselves doing, was um, engaging with either the Holy Spirit or some other spir uh, spirits um, on an individual level. So, so they called it the spiritual world. The, the, the spiritual, and then, w so when we look at the spirituality, this concept of spirituality and the spiritual world and what they're doing in these, um, through these spiritual practices, then we can get away with these, uh, then we can get away from these uh, grand ideas of religion and uh, these uh, ethic terms. Maybe that's a way. Just a, a short comment, I, I, I found this uh, invitation to inquire about any category about religion very insight, insightful and challenging. I was thinking that um, uh, how the, the way uh, people categorize their, their own experience are also, um, they also use the same categories that sometimes we use. Uh, so uh, if I ask a young man from upper middle classes and 
In Buenos Aires, what do they do every day? They will tell me that they go to mass, uh, they go to church, uh, they go to practice some sport uh, because they are Catholic and that's a religion. I mean, they use this almost the same words that I use to, ref to try to, to categorize, categorize their, their practices. But at the same time, um, uh, these practices are all uh, mixed and they are mixed in very uh, particular ways because uh, in the top clubs uh, of rugby, uh, they, they go to, to a psycho psychologist, individual, and they have a, a team psychologist. Well, Buenos Aires is the most psychoanalyzed city of Latin America, <laughs> unfortunately, or I don't know. Uh, but, um, uh, and they go to church as well, and they go to, to gym every day in order to, to improve and to to, to be well trained and prepared to sport, and all of all, all those things uh, don't opposite uh, each each other. I mean, uh, they are all mixed, and they all make sense in order to become a good player. But as they see it, a good person as well in the in, in those moral frames that they move every day. I think the, the idea of context is very important. Neo-Pentecostalism in Brazil is not the same as Uros is. is. Uh, Neo-Pentecostalism in Brazil is also, all, all religion means ex exclusion. It's inclusion and exclusion. But someone has violent ways of exclusion. No? Neo-Pentecostalism in Brazil now, it's in our spiritual warfare against Afro Brazilian religions. They are attacking the places, the sacred places of the Umbanda, Candomblé. This is a, a real issue for, for us. So the, the question of context is very important. It's very important to analyze the context to understand the rising of a, a specific religion. Uh, Sebastian was telling that uh, in Buenos Aires, psychoanalysis is very common, and it's real. A society that has a, a large middle class uh, has ways of going to a psychoanalysis. In Brazil, not, not so much. So every context is very important, and I, I think it, you have a good question. I don't think we have <laughs> any more time left, so a round of applause for our panelists and presenters. And thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you.